Okay, today we are very, very uh, thankful to have Rory Scherer to join us today. He's a qualified vet, but he's also, uh, he has veered a little bit away from his vet uh, or clinical work, and he's just going to explain to us a little bit more of what he's doing these days. So Rory, just to start off with, uh, can I just ask you, why did you become a vet in the first place? Ah, um, oh, hi, Lennon. Um, yeah, I have to cast my mind back a, a fair way, but I suppose, to be honest, uh, um, my both my parents are doctors and uh my uncle and grandparents had a farm so it you know it sort of became a natural variation on the medical farming theme to end up being a vet really yeah i think that's how i fell into it yeah when did you know you wanted to be a vet um i imagine it must have been around you know 13 14 something like that yeah Cool. And which vet college you go to? Edinburgh. Um, so yes, when I qualified, um, you know, uh, being based in Scotland, the, the major choices were Glasgow mm -hmm. or Edinburgh, and uh, uh, yeah, I chose Edinburgh. Yeah. Nice. And how did you find vet college? Um, a lot of fun, I think, is is the best way to put it. Yeah, I didn't. Uh, um, I suppose I. I didn't apply myself in order to deliberately get um, distinctions and, and credits, etc. cetera. I, I think I found a, a fairly nice middle road between uh, enjoying my time there and the, you know, all the other things that you can do at university and various other um, clubs and activities and the social side of things as, as well as kind of uh, getting through the exams and all the work that was required at uh, vet school itself. Yeah. What will you consider? What will you consider are your challenges that you face in college? Um, well, I'm not entirely sure if the challenges I faced 20, 25 years ago are necessarily relevant to the challenge that, that students might be facing, facing today. I think, um, I think back then, the only challenge was probably you know personal to me, which was. Um, always putting things off to the last minute so anything that involved coursework or uh, um, would get put off put off and then just be done by a, a, a very late night the night before or something that was due um, yeah I, maybe I have a kind of rose tinted view of, of what those days were like but um, I don't actually recall that many challenges per se yeah it sounded like you enjoyed it. Uh, you, you enjoyed college quite a bit. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Yeah. yeah. And when you saw sort of qualified, tell tell us more about your first job. What was that like? And um, so I'm actually in. Um, I became a partner in um, the job that I first started in. So I, I haven't had um, a job in a different very practice other than. Uh, where I was a new graduate. So um, I was at Edinburgh Vet School and I um, joined a practice about uh, four or five miles from Edinburgh Vet School. And I was there, it was a mixed practice and I had three vets at that time in one site. And then, yeah, over the years, things grew and changed and uh, I became a partner and um, and then yeah um, i'm still although i no longer own the practice i'm no longer a partner there i still actually work there in, in some capacity to this day sounds amazing what did you feel that uh, vet college had uh, prepared you very well for working life um the short answer to that is no and i imagine that you know um, plenty qualified vets would probably feel something similar in that um okay. I guess one of those examples might be as simple as, um, you know, one of the more common things to come in the door might be something as, as simple as a broken nail. But I don't recall anyone at vet school telling me how to fix a dog with a broken nail, for example. Whereas, um, you know, I could tell you a fair bit about Cushing's disease and Addison's disease and all the rest of it. But uh, yeah, that day one when some kind of just practical in just, um, injuries and things kind of walk in, then. Uh, you've got to think on your feet a little bit. Yeah. Mm. Apart from uh, the so-called common things being common that were not so commonly taught in vet college, 
were there any other areas that you felt um, that you were sort of uh, inadequate in or you felt that they could have been more useful for more training? Um, I think when you start, you, you feel pretty inadequate in every area, really. Um, and, you know, being in the consulting room, you know, by yourself for the first time, um, I, I think you lay expectations on yourself of having to solve um, every problem that's right there in front of you within the 5, 10, 15 minute, you know, time frame of that consultation you have. I, I think only after a while or with the right sort of mentorship or guidance, you realize that, um, you know, not all problems need to be set, uh, solved right there and then. And, and in reality, you can, um, you know, you just have to have a similar approach to every case, which involves getting a, a good history, making sure you don't miss uh, much when you examine the animal and then make a plan from there. And uh, that plan might have to adjust, you know, as, as new information comes your way, really. but yeah. I think I felt inadequate in not necessarily knowing that, and I suppose trying to put more pressure on oneself to you know solve every problem as and when it presented itself. Yeah. Mm. You were talking about mentorship and guidance. So, who did you have as a mentor, or where do you seek your guidance from when you were in those situations? Um, yes, yeah, so when I joined the practice, there was a. Um, it was owned by a sole proprietor and. Um, you know, so he was my boss and uh, I had uh, a colleague who later became a business partner as well as um, uh, the boss um, who was a year above me at vet school. He'd, he'd been working in the practice a, a year already. And I think that was interesting for him because um, he suddenly went from being the youngest in the practice to then suddenly, you know, being above me and, and helping me out and teaching. And I think that was a um, interesting transition for him and um, um, but yeah my boss um, who became a business partner um, was also you know just pretty laid back and you know had a good uh, approach to um, veterinary life you know, um, that uh, some things you know you can fix and some things you, you just can't but um, try and manage the owner or the farmer or the um, you know whoever's expectations as you go along and, and you know try you know you'll not get too un unstuck I mean, if you take that sort of considered honest approach to your knowledge and your skills yeah. i think it's a very very healthy perspective to have really some something you, you cannot win everything yeah. Yeah. yeah um tell us a little bit more about what's your journey like as a vet so after that you're going to practice in the same practice then after you became partner um yeah just if if somebody wanted to find out what is life after graduation uh, and just wanted you to share your story. Would you mind just sharing us your story? Like what happens and what are you doing right now? What did it transit to and things like that? Um, yes, yeah, so um, I, you know, I, after graduation, you know, this was a one in three um, out of hours and, you know, busy pra mixed practice and being on call. So there, it was very, um much you put the hours in and um you know you took as so much enjoyment and uh, you, as you could from the successes and uh um and there's lots of that and you form relationships with the clients and you know but the the days sort of rolled into one and the weeks rolled into you know more weeks and and because yeah it was just that you know constant um you know journey of of learning and and doing stuff and getting caught up in the doing. Um, when I became a partner, I took a greater in, so that was after being qualified for about six and a half years, I took a greater interest in uh, the business side of things. You know, I had a vested interest at that point. And, it, and it's incredible, the, the shift in mindset that goes from being um, an associate that working in a practice where you don't necessarily care about lights being on turned on needlessly and wasting energy and uh, um, you know wasting money here and there and uh, you don't necessarily care about giving away freebies to your clients that you've you've known for reasons of length of time and then you know that changes a little bit as soon as uh, your own livelihood is on the line um, and even you know the ability to pay the wages for your team is on the line as to whether you make these right decisions about wastage and uh, uh, charging properly etc. 
so that was a bit of a baptism of fire to you know a large extent you know, becoming a partner and uh and re- realizing there was a whole different world um to veterinary medicine um and I, I felt obliged and actually you know to a large point interested in delving deeper into that and i yeah, you know subsequent to that probably i did much less clinical cpd and and uh shows a lot more business CPD whenever there was events on. Um, And after that, so you were a partner there, how long were you a partner there for? um, I was a partner for 10 years before um, we decided to sell uh, the practice to IBC. Um, So yeah, Mm. from 2001, I graduated uh, 2008. So yeah, six and a half years, um, I a partner in 2018 and sold to IBC. And what have you been doing since? Um, so I have retained the um, uh, role or title of clinical director uh, since IBC have uh, taken over. However, um, I only work very much part time and, uh, you know, in a both strategic and sort of mentorship role for the two full-time CDs we have um, at the practice. Um, I still uh, feel I um, get a lot from that, even though it's a part-time role. Uh, you know, I still you know, feel that I'm contributing something to the, the business, the business still keeps growing and we, we, we still um, you know, keep offering a, a great service, I think, to our clients and pets. So I'm happy doing that. But there's no doubt that um, I wanted to spread my wings a little bit beyond even just the running of a practice or just the clinical aspects of a practice and I thought about uh, um, other um, ways that I could use uh, my knowledge and skills so I set up a company to teach uh, other practices how to do laparoscopy Um, and on top of that I decided to take on a qualification in coaching as well Um, and I don't uh, currently have a coaching business, but um, you know, that's quite something that uh, I might delve deeper into in the future. Um, at the moment, I really enjoy um, the laparoscopy training business, uh, to be honest. It's a, you know, a great to uh, travel up and down the country and, and teach vets um, how to do laparoscopy. Amazing. Um, usually, I mean, when people have a picture of uh, becoming a vet, you know, they read some James Herod books and they want to be a vet and a picture of it is clinical work, whether it is in a practice or on farms or with horses and things like that. So jumping deck to actually setting up a company to teach laparoscopy is quite a different sort of, a, it's not something that people would imagine that to be. What was the transition like for you? Um, I, I guess I... Um... I've always admired um, entrepreneurs, really, uh, you know, in any industry. I think there's mm. um, something, um, yeah, just something I respect about uh, trying to solve a problem and, 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 you know, create value from solving that problem for yourself um, and for, you know, the the client as it were um, and then you can you know out of nothing create a business that employs people etc and, and grows and yeah that that whole process um i guess i got a taste of when i started um thinking more about the practice that i owned um, but once that was up and running and it, you know as, as established as it as it is it's now a you know 20 vet practice if you like um, i just wanted something new and different um, a lot of people say, you know, do what you love and, and then it's not work. It's, uh, um, you know, it's just life. having fun. It's just life. And uh, I have uh, been doing laparoscopy for uh, nine, ten years. Um, I love, um, you know, it, it, it remains just a very cool thing to do. I think it was just an amazing way to do surgery. I, I, as a young boy, I remember. Um, watching um, TV programs talking about uh, keyhole surgery as a you know as a new technique in humans and always been fascinated by it. So so to be able to you know, do that myself personally in a very world is, is great. I also love teaching. Um, uh, so yeah, I thought you know, there must be a way of 
learning laparoscopy in a safer, better way than I did, which was trotting along to a cadaver course and then having to um, persuade the nurses back at the practice that, that this definitely was a good idea and that all this expensive, fragile equipment, um, and they shouldn't need to worry about too much and all the rest of it. But uh, yeah, so ended up with a um, kind of a complete training package, the aim being that um, I turn up at your practice um, and we do some live lap spades that uh, I think genuinely gives much better learning and potentially a safer, um, uh, more confident surgeon than you necessarily might be going off and, and just doing a cadaver course. And the nurses um, who are understandably anxious about all the expensive and uh, fragile equipment, um, I walk through step by step on how to maintain it, clean it, look after it. Um, and you know, while I'm there, just hopefully inject a little bit of enthusiasm, confidence and, and knowledge to the, the whole team about um, all the benefits of laparoscopy. And, and, and there are many, it, it, it's genuinely um, a procedure that um, you know, for a lap spay has much less pain for the animal and much faster recovery and, and therefore lots of benefits to the, the animal and the clients. I, I totally agree because as you know, over here we do lap space as well and the difference is uh, so obvious and so obvious. Yeah. Um, what about the coaching business? That's interesting. So what were your thoughts? What were you thinking of when you actually got into it? And how and what exactly is that apply? How are you applying that to your current uh, job that you're doing? Yeah, well, I mean, to be honest, I, I started that you know coaching qualification. Um, we uh, the practice I own, we worked very closely with uh, Vet Dynamics, a business consultancy that um, did wonders for our um, our business, and it was. Um, you know, the, there's many aspects to what Vedonamic does, but um, you know, coaching is one of them, and I, I sort of became more personally interested in it, um, and then decided to start the qualification of coaching myself without any real um, outcome in mind, other than wanting to know more about the skills involved, and um, that they might be turned to, you know, continuing to run my practice that the uh, you know employed. 50 odd people so the um the reality was that um you know selling the practice ended up being uh, the best decision for us and i have these skills um but i don't know which direction i'll necessarily take them but i think you know just on a simple day-to-day -day basis they still are very valuable i still use them in my mentorship of the um uh, some of the executive management team in the practice and um, I might even have opportunities in the future who knows working with other veterinary business consultancies to um, um, in a similar fashion that I learned from um, and if time allowing when maybe my kids are a bit older and you know tied up at school more then I might even contemplate uh, um, you know an actual coaching business one-to-one -one of, of my own yeah cool and i wanted to get your take on this so you know in our profession in this vet profession there are some sort of fairly startling statistics going on whereby there's quite a high rate of depression and um, there's also a high rate of attrition where people actually stop being vets that in uk you know vets is considered one of the job shortages and it's not really because we're not producing enough vets it's because many vets are actually falling out from the profession and last but not least, also a quite a high uh, rate of uh, suicide. You know, vets are more likely to commit suicide twice more likely compared to the medical profession and four times more likely than the general public. However, you usually, it's not unusual when you tell people that you're a vet, many people would go, oh, that's amazing. I always want to be a vet, such a great job, what a noble profession, and it is. So my, I want to know your take on that. Why do you think if it's such an amazing profession and job, uh, that such statistics do exist at this present moment in time. What's your take on that? Well, I wish I had an, you know, an easy answer to it, to be honest, but um, I think there's so many factors involved. I think you can think about everything from, you know, there is a tendency um, 
for you know that emerged into attract uh, um, applicants that are high achieving in the in the first place. Um, so you might go through your school and even a lot of your university life um, without necessarily having to experience too much failure. Um, but then suddenly, you know, real life of uh, treating animals in practice um, inevitably leads to, you know, some failures here and there. And uh, that can hit you hard and be very stressful. There's no doubt about it. And then you combine that with, I think, although there perhaps is a, a general perception amongst the public that uh, vets are respected and um, uh, it would be a great job to be it doesn't take too many one-to-one -one incidences with unhappy clients who are unhappy in in the moment for you know reasons of uh, around finances or around you know things that haven't gone wrong that you don't necessarily feel like um, you're a respected profession um, so I think there's you know those are fairly big aspects uh, you know that you you suddenly enter a world where um failure can be quite commonplace but without necessarily the right teaching or the right experience to um, um to allow you to accept that easily um, and what you thought was a um you know a hugely well-respected profession when actually you know faced with individuals criticizing you or, or you know assuming that um you're in it just for the money for example is just you know very hard to take really mm -hmm. the um you know from my personal perspective i think what i found a little bit difficult about practice as well is that you know i'm you know, fairly introverted really and the so that you know the constant interaction of a day's consulting of 50 minutes after 50 minutes is hugely draining you know so by the end of a day of consulting then um you don't have much left in the tank um because it's you know it, it is a you know very draining way to spend your day if you're on the more introverted side which i think a reasonable number of events probably are um, so I used to love my days in theatre, um, but, you know, slightly less so the, the days in the consulting room. And uh, um, it's the days in the consulting room that we often tend to also get faced with, you know, some of the more likely criticisms and, uh, you know, direct feedback from, from clients, etc. So it all adds up to, you know, maybe not the job, maybe not meeting your expectations and, and then thinking that actually there are, uh, friends or colleagues of yours in other industries who uh, don't seem to be experiencing the same level of stress and, and perhaps getting um, you know better financial remuneration as well depending on what profession they tend to be in. So. That's a good point you picked up as well because another thing that is uh, not uncommon as well is when you say you're a vet and then uh, people go wow you must be minted so what's your thoughts on that how how rich are actually vets are and is is it an extremely lucrative profession um well it's you know there, there's two sides to it currently in uh, in reality I and mean, i think um if you're an employed vet then um the answer is it you know and there's enough statistics out there to show that it, it really doesn't compare well against for example lawyers doctors uh, dentists in, in terms of total remuneration for for the hours worked um whether they're valid comparisons or not is maybe um you know a different question but uh, um the if those are folks that you surrounded yourself at uh, university with uh, you know who went on to become lawyers and doctors and dentists etc from school then those, those are the comparisons you, you naturally tend to make and you, you might be a bit disappointed when you um see what uh um, what you're getting as an associate vet salary compared to others mm -hmm. um but in the public view um the challenge is that um i think partly because we have a national health service that most people don't understand you know the, the genuine costs involved in in providing health care and so they you know i think to a large extent can't uh, can't be blamed for thinking that any money that goes over the counter 
um, in the vet practice, uh, um, almost all of it goes to the vet, not realizing that it's um, you know, a very high overhead business to be in. Um, the challenge then though is that actually there is now a cohort of vets who, um, because of corporatization and, and selling to practices who, who are wealthy. So you, you do have, you know, two sides to the story of, yes, there is a, a lot of um, money to be made in the veterinary industry, in industry um, but whether vets, nurses, receptionists actually as employed individuals see the right proportion of that is, um, and the proportion that the public necessarily think they get um, are two very different things. That's a very good point. So putting the money aside, talking about a depression, a high dropout rate and a suicide, if you had a magic wand, how do you think this issue can be resolved if possible and what needs to be done to actually reduce the suicide or eliminate suicide and reduce the depression and drop out? What needs to happen in your opinion? Well, that, you know, I think there's lots of people who are who are working on this and lots of people who are um, you know much more involved and much wiser than, than I am but I, you know the types of things that strike a chord with me are um, I, you know, those who have gone before I suppose you know like myself admitting that you know they didn't get everything right you know so if you are in practice um, and you're um, right, they're only kind of looked up to by younger vets. I think it's it should be um, something that you freely admit that you didn't get everything right when you know you were at their stage. Um, I think a, a no blame culture within the uh, the practice, so that mistakes don't have to be you know covered up or hidden, um, and that you know just a way of talking about when things go wrong in a no blame way and um, that everyone's had similar experiences and that mm. what you should really take from any incident like that is just a way of learning for the future you know that's how most you know um most vets their their most important lessons of how they approach cases have normally become because something really didn't go right at some point earlier in their career and, and uh, a lesson to learn from it you know what would your advice be to, you know, somebody doing A-levels who wants to be a vet? What would your single advice be to them to say that, look, uh, you know, I've been a vet for so long. This is what I'd like you to know before you embark on this journey. Well, um, I think the first bit is that, um, you know, going to vet school does not mean that when you come out the other side of it, you are the vet that you might currently know in the practice down the road from you who has been you know treating your dog or, or cat you know having a veterinary degree can take you in endless different directions so um i think it's a great you know uh, career path to embark upon because you can make it your own you know genuinely so um and whether you uh, want to be entrepreneurial and set up uh, something completely new or whether you want to find yourself in, um, you know, uh, pharmaceuticals or research or um, One Health, um, you know, involved much more closely in epidemiology, for example, you know, the current COVID situation um, you know, definitely requires input from uh, those that have training in all sides of the defense whether it be human medicine, battery medicine, and epidemiology, etc. So yeah, so um so even if the picture of the vet in the consulting room in the surgery down the road from you appeals at the moment, and hopefully it will do uh, when you get into the other side of vet school and um uh, come out the other side. Um, it doesn't have to stay that way forever, which is fantastic. You know, I just reached the stage where I wanted to do something different. Um, yeah. What's the name of your company that teaches the proscopy? Uh, we're Simply Keyhole. Simply Keyhole. Simply Keyhole. And I said that um, that's uh, been set up with um, 
my colleague uh, Becky Keeble, who is also clinical director in, in um, our practice, and Will Seymour, who uh, used to be a, a vet in your practice, and then he's uh, very entrepreneurial indeed and has a number of other businesses of his own there. So we, um, um, the three of us, uh, have worked really hard over the last uh, three years or so to build it up, and then, and yeah, it's it's just taking off busier and busier um, um, every year. Great. Good. I'll make sure that it's included in the show notes. Well, thank you very much, Rory. That was extremely insightful, especially your personal experience of why you came about your own journey and also not just being a classic bed in a consult room, branching off to having your own company and also coaching as well. Uh, I'm sure you've inspired many viewers over here. So thank you very much for that. Thank you, man. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Okay, I just stopped the recording. Uh...